If you take your Bibles, go to 1 Kings chapter 3. In the book of Deuteronomy, we read the Shema. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. The word Shema is actually that word hear. So if you were to read in the Hebrew, it would, it would, it would say Shema, the Lord, uh, or Shema, O Israel, the Lord, our God is one, one God. And so it's the, that first word is very important here. And the, as I said a few minutes ago, the Shema was repeated throughout the day. It, it's the focal point of Judaism. It is uh, where some, some sects of uh, Judaism take it too far and they do wear the phylacteries and they, they put uh, little scrolls on their homes and things like that. And, uh, you know, doing that in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it's missing the point of the passage. That point of that passage is to, to, to hear God speak and do it. It's not to, to wear a little wooden box or to literally follow a pattern. It's it's making sure that we instruct ourselves and we instruct our family in the Word of God to keep it as a display in front of us, not literally, but spiritually. We know that if these words are not received by the heart of the person, then are they really heard? If your child, you tell your child to do something and they don't do it, are they listening? Well, we would say, no, they may have heard what you said, but they're not obeying what you have asked or commanded. And in the same manner, that, that word shema is to hear with the intention of obeying. To hear with the heart. And when I say the heart, I mean the inner spiritual man that was created by God. Created in His image to, to mirror him, the part of man that communes with God, that hears God speak to our conscience, that pricking of our heart, that challenges us with what is false and what is true, the part of man that awakens and brings new life into him. It's more than just the brain capturing knowledge and taking that knowledge and even applying it in our daily life. It is discerning and using the truth of God. It's a spiritual discernment. That's what it means to hear. And in 1 Kings, we have the life of Solomon. Now, we would call Solomon the wisest man to ever live, and I think that is correct. And uh, we know that Solomon, uh, God appeared to Solomon, and, and uh, God asked Solomon, I could give you anything you want. What is it that you would like? And uh, we would probably all answer that Solomon asked for wisdom. But that's not what he asked for. And so we're going to study that passage, but I want to see even leading up to that, the tenderness of Solomon. We don't generally think of Solomon as being somebody who is very tender. We, we think of Solomon later in his life. It's interesting how we perceive that about characters of the Bible. You know, we look at David, the life of David, and we think of, when we think David, we think a man after God's own heart, right? A man that loved God, and we think of a young, ruddy boy who's killing Goliath and fleeing from Saul and leading the mighty men and doing all these amazing things. We don't tend to think of David and Bathsheba and David and, and you know, the faltering as a father later in life. We picture David in, in the spiritual context of his younger years. And then when we think of Solomon, how do we think of Solomon? We think of Solomon in his later years. You know, a thousand wives, 700 concubines, 300 wives, and multiplied horses and power. But we do think of him as the wisest man to ever live. And yet here in 1 Kings chapter 3, there is this, there's this tenderness of Solomon that I think we can overpass, we can miss. So would you read 1 Kings chapter 3? We'll start reading in verse 3. Read just a little ways. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeah, Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar." And so right away, we see in verse 3 that Solomon loved the Lord. He loved the Lord, and it's demonstrated in the way that he walked. He loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. 
So he loved the Lord, and he loved the Lord by walking with the Lord. To walk means to follow along as a companion. In this case, he's following along as a companion with God. He's walking with God, traveling uh, through life with God. They're not separate, they're together. He's learning of the Lord. Not only that, he walked in God's statutes. Now you say, wait a second, Pastor. It says he walked in the statutes of David, his father. But let me ask you, whose statutes did David, his father, walk in? He walked in the statutes of the Lord. And so Solomon is following the pattern of David, which is following the statutes of the Lord. By the way, Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He says, be followers of me, even as I am of Christ. So Paul says, I'm following Christ. Would you come along with me and follow Christ along with me? And that's the idea here. David followed after God. And now Solomon is saying, or Solomon, it, God is saying, well, let me rephrase that. God is saying that Solomon follows along in the same pattern of his father. He's following the statutes of God. Now, David may have failed with some of his children, but it seems, and you could maybe put this to Solomon's mother more than him, but he, he follows uh, God's instruction of Deuteronomy, and he teaches his son the ways of the Lord. And he teaches his son how to walk to the point that Solomon is, is, loves God, and God himself says that Solomon is walking in the statutes. In fact, if you want to see what the statutes are, look at verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy according to as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And so Solomon is following a good pattern that his father laid out. And he's following the, he, he's walking with God. He's a companion of God. He's following the ordinances of God the commands that God gave with the intention that God gave them. And so there's an element here of heart devotion, I think we can say. I think that's clear because it says the two things, that Solomon loved the Lord and he walked with the Lord according to the statutes that his father taught him. Not only that, he's worshiping. He's going to sacrifice to to God. And so Solomon's trying to please the Lord, and, and there's a, a phrase here that maybe is familiar to you from reading other parts of Scripture. In, in verse 3, it says, Solomon loved the, Lord as, uh, loved the Lord, walked in the statutes of David's father, only, with the exception, you could say, he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. Now, David did that too, and when you read that, you might think, ooh, the high places, and your mind might immediately go to the, the major prophets or the minor prophets, where the high places soon became the, the centers of idolatrous worship, the places where people wanted to go if they wanted to worship Baal secretly or, or Molech or, or different false gods, they would go to the high places, they're called high places because they're, they're really high, right? They're mountaintops. They're, they're, uh, they're out in nature, groves, secluded places, and they would go to the high places because that's what man always seems to be doing, right? All the way back to the Tower of Babel, they're trying to get to God. And, and so here, uh, you might think that that's what Solomon's doing, but it says that Solomon didn't worship false gods. He worshiped the Lord. And he sacrificed to the Lord at the high places, so I would contest that Solomon is trying to worship the Lord, but he's not quite doing it in the exact pattern that God laid out. He's doing it with his heart. He's trying to please the Lord, but it's not the pattern that God laid out. Well, what's the pattern God laid out? God gave him the tabernacle. God gave him the tabernacle, and there, corporately, sacrifice was to be made to the Lord. Yet Solomon is making sacrifice, you could say kind of privately, elsewhere. Now, there is no tabernacle. The tabernacle was destroyed. The ark was taken away. Remember under Eli, uh, Eli the prophet and his two sons, his two sons were wicked and they took the ark because they thought it was some kind of, you know, uh, talisman, some magic trick that they could take to the battle so that they would win the battle. And what happens? The Philistines capture the ark and take it away. And David brings it back. But did David bring it back the right way? David puts the ark and he puts it on a an ox cart, and they're bringing it back. 
I remember, I can't remember the guy's name. Uzzah, yeah, Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark. God strikes him dead. Why? Well, disobedience, but disobedience by who? Uzzah and David. David did not follow the pattern that God laid out to carry the ark properly. Uh, Solomon's kind of doing the same thing now. He's following an incorrect pattern. He's trying to worship the Lord, but he's following an incorrect pattern. He's trying to worship the Lord by giving him sacrifice, but he's doing it in the manner not as God prescribed. Sacrifice was to be done corporately as a nation, before the nation, and he's doing it here in a high place. Solomon is worshiping, and yet God is pleased. You know, just as a gentle reminder to us, worship, worship must be personal. It has to be personal. If you're not worshiping God personally throughout the week, even right now, then you're failing to give God the adoration that he deserves. But there's also a corporate element. It's why we gather together. It's why gathering together is so important, where we challenge one another, encourage one another. We come collectively together to give God praise that he deserves in in mass. And there's no substitute for corporate worship. And so uh, this is a good reminder for us. How do you worship? How do you participate in corporate worship? You're doing it right now, hopefully. Hopefully. You're listening, and you're listening as we open up God's word. We sang. We sang earlier. Hopefully you sang. Maybe you say, well, listen, I don't, I don't sing well. I, don't, I didn't know the song, or I don't, I don't like to sing, and so you, maybe you just moved your mouth, but did your heart sing? I hope your heart sang. When we, when we prayed, did you pause and, and try to not think about other things and give God the attention that he deserves? When we opened up God's word and read scripture, did you, did you read along? Did you try to capture the, the truth that was, was being given? I hope you participate in corporate worship because the message it sends, if you don't, is damaging. I'll be blunt. I know there's people playing games on their phone today and that really ticks me off and hopefully it doesn't matter what I think right it matters what God thinks playing games cruising Facebook you think I don't know what that looks like like unless you are an avid note taker you know this is not how I take notes by the way What does that say, though? What does that say of our worship of God? What does that say to our children sitting next to us, watching us, give more attention to some mindless activity than to the Lord? All right, I'll stop meddling for the moment. The moment. Solomon here offers, it's it's with his heart, he kind of misses the mark a little bit, Yet he hits it well in other areas. Verse 4, And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. And so he gives an offering here, and this offering is a costly offering. You think about just what is entailed in this. Solomon did not just go up to the the mountain and be like, all right, I've got to give God something. Whoa, a thousand bulls, right? It, It took preparation, He didn't just arrive to give God worship and try to muster it together. And yet, how often do we do that? We arrive and we're going to try to sit, find our seat, our seat in the auditorium so that we can can prepare to worship God. No, the, the worship should happen before. And Solomon prepares his heart for worship. He prepares his offering. It's also a very costly offering. Uh, Of course, it should be costly for him because he's the richest man or soon to be the richest man ever. And he should be able to give God something more than two mites, more than two turtle doves, more than one bowl or ten bowls. And so he offers a thousand. A thousand bowls offered in sacrifice to the Lord. And it is worshipful. He is honoring God. And we know that the offering pleases God because verse 5 tells us that God speaks. And God speaks to to Solomon and he offers him a blessing. 
In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of the people, thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this Thy so great a people. And so we see Solomon's desire here. He desires, I'm going to say discernment. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, the Lord blesses Solomon. God appears to him in the dream and offers a blessing to Solomon because of his worship, because of his heart pouring out to God, because of his desire. And we see his desire. It's going to be listed here in a moment. But even before he gets to the, 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 the desire, the answer to the question, Solomon requests with humility an understanding heart. So he requests, or it begins, his request begins with humility. And we see that in verse 6, where he, sa- he talks about his father. And he says, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. He says, Now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant, in other words, him, me, king, instead of David my father. And so he makes his request but he does it with a humble heart so solomon first worships god then he worships god by acknowledging god's blessing in david his father and he acknowledges that blessing quite clearly and this is not a he uses some phrases that to us seem a little bit out of place that thou has put me instead of david my father to be king he says that it's not that he he was displeased with david and took him out and put solomon in It's the idea is he now sits upon the throne of his father, David. Why? Well, if you know Scripture, it's because God promised David that he would give him a son in the Davidic covenant who would sit upon that throne, and from that son would then come the Messiah years later. So it's a promise. He's referring to the Davidic covenant here, and he's saying, God, you did exactly what you said you would do. You blessed my father, and you've allowed me now to sit upon the throne. But there's a problem Solomon feels very unfit to rule and he should and so in humility he comes to request God an understanding heart Solomon praises God he praises God for David by the way Solomon doesn't have David's history there should be trepidation in Solomon's heart in Solomon's life, because he's not his father. He doesn't have his father's history. He doesn't have his father's personality. He doesn't have uh, all of his father's backing, uh, right? That's kind of clear from some other things that occurred. And, and so Solomon recognizes he's stepping in for, by the way, who Israel still says is the greatest king they've ever had. So imagine if it was like day one, right? And he's king. We're talking thousands of years later, Israel's still saying, greatest king ever, David. David, nobody could pass David. And so imagine if you're Solomon that day, and you're going to be the new king, and you're following David. And he's scared. And he should be. But he's humble. He acknowledges his frailty and his weakness in verse 7. Now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. 
I read that phrase, and that's really interesting. He's basically saying, I don't even know how to behave myself as a king. And I think, wait a second. He's grown up in the court, right? He's grown up in the palace. He's, he's the one who's been declared to be the next king since the time that he was born, and yet he's in great trepidation about what he's supposed to do, how he's supposed to behave. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do or how he's supposed to do it. Well, I think the key is verse 8. He says, I'm but a little child in verse 7. I know not how to go out or come in. Verse 8 says, and thy servant is in the midst or in the middle of thy people, thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. You know what he's saying? God, I don't know how to come in and go out to lead the people for you. Whose people are they? They're not Solomon's people. They're God's people. Israel is is meant to be a theocracy, that God is the king, and there's a human spokesman, and that's how it was with Eli. And then they desired a human king, and God gave them Saul, and then David, and now Solomon. And so with great trepidation, he says, I don't know how to lead these people for you, Lord. These are your people. They're a great people. I don't know what to do. And it's upon that that Solomon makes his request in verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to discern thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And so Solomon seeks, and he seeks to hear God. Verse 9, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. It's one word in the Hebrew. The word understanding heart is one word. It's the word Shema. Lord, give me a heart to hear. To hear with the purpose of obeying. Help me to know what you desire. Help me to think what you think. Help me to discern between good and bad, good and evil, that I would know what you say is truth and what you say is not truth. Lord, help me to lead these people because I don't know how to spiritually lead these people. Lord, give me an understanding heart. Give me ears to hear. A heart that hears. Give me Shema. The word Shema or hear appears hundreds of times in Scripture, but it has a unique use. We see that unique use in Deuteronomy, and we see it here in the, in the context. It's the idea of hearing with obedience or hearing with understanding or, or hearing with discernment, and that's how it is here. He says, give thy servant, give there, therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge that I may discern between good and bad. You see, we always say that, G, that, that Solomon asks God for wisdom, but it's more than wisdom. It's more than just knowledge and the application of that knowledge. That's what wisdom is, the application of knowledge. Because he's not asking for human knowledge. He's not asking for human wisdom. He's asking for a heart that hears what God says and the discernment to use it. It's much more than just wisdom. He pleads with God for that. So he asks for this understanding heart. What's the understanding heart? Well, actually, I think it's linked back with verse 6. Where Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart. You see, it's the truth, knowing the truth. The righteousness is the applying of the truth. And the uprightness of heart is the how. He's asking God, I don't just want to know what is right. I want to be able to apply what is right, and I want to apply it the right way. How? With my heart. Lord, I need that. And he's desperately pleading to God to give him a Shema. A heart that hears and understands. 
literally, if you wanted to, to describe the word, I would, I would say to hear intelligently, listening for the purpose to obey. And so we saw it there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Hear, O Israel. But this word actually appears multiple places. It also appears in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1, where he tells them you should be ready to hear. Be more ready to hear. Would you turn with me there to Ecclesiastes 5? We'll just read it briefly. So there it is, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1. Keep thy foot. Notice the context. Where? When thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that that they do evil. Be more ready to listen with the purpose of obeying. Real plainly, can I just ask you, when you come to worship God, is your heart prepared to listen with the purpose of obeying? That if God instructs you, if God speaks to your heart, He challenges your conscience, He, he, he encourages you in, in one way or convicts you in another, are you ready, eager to obey what He asks you to do? That's the idea here of Ecclesiastes 5, 1. That's the idea of Shema. It appears also in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 23, where he says, Give ye ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. In fact, it occurs multiple times. If you're looking for a negative use, it also occurs in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, where Isaiah is uh, listening to God and God appears and he sees the, the train of God and God asks that great question, who will go and who shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, Lord, send me. And what's the very next verse, verse 9, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Oh, you might hear the words, but you refuse to listen. It's like anti-Shema. They hear and say, nah, I'd just rather do my own thing. And by the way, speaking of the nation of Israel, so over and over, God asks us to hear with this intention of listening. It occurs in the New Testament too, and this is a really important passage. Go with me there to Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in all of the scripture? And Jesus answers with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 5, the Shema. And it's really important. They're trying to trap Jesus, maybe, or, or possibly this person genuinely wants to know what's the greatest commandment for me to follow. It's really important because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, and we have that word Shema, but the New Testament's written in Greek. And so by Jesus gives us this verse, it actually tells us what's the Greek equivalent of Shema. So it's really important. We're going to see that in a minute. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? In other words, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment commandment and so jesus makes it very clear it's not even a debate in fact at the scribe even was like wow nailed it that's a, we agree holy and jesus is like oh i was hoping you would agree right 
It's really important because Jesus uses that word here. Quotes, direct quote, but it's not Shema. In fact, the Greek word is akrobus. It comes in different forms. And it's so important because it appears elsewhere in the New Testament. So what does God have to say elsewhere in the New Testament about this idea of hearing with the intent of obeying? Would you go to Luke chapter 1, just a few pages over? Luke chapter 1, verse 3. Seems like a minor verse, almost inconsequential, because here Luke is just giving his introduction. Luke 1, verse 3, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. And you say, that is important? Well, Luke is writing the gospel, and he's writing it to one person. The Gospel of Luke is written to Theophilus. And it's written to him that he might understand the purpose and the life of Jesus Christ. But notice what Luke says about himself. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect acrobus understanding, or shema, if you want to use the Hebrew. He's not saying he's perfect. He's not saying he never gets anything wrong. He's simply saying that he has listened to the gospel himself for the purpose of understanding and receiving it, and now he wants to pass it on to Theophilus. Luke Luke was not a haphazard student. He wasn't a, a, a wayward disciple. He was someone who wanted to hear the truth of Christ and instill it into his life, absorb it, and then do it. And now he's passing it on to Theophilus. It appears elsewhere as well. If you'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. This is the last one we'll look at. Ephesians 5. A great theological, uh, deep theological book. Verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, And arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, or wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's not the word understand there, it's the word circumspect. Circumspect is akrabus. Circumspect means a a proper view. If you were to be circumspectful in life, you would have a proper view concerning the things around you. That's the idea of circumspect. And here, it's the idea Shema. To listen for the purpose of obeying. It's spiritual wisdom and discernment. We're to walk as people who have spiritual wisdom and discernment and apply it to their life, not as fools, but as wise. We're to redeem the time because the days are evil. Not as those who are unwise, but those who have understanding and obey what the will of the Lord is. So it's discernment with the intention of obeying. Do you listen to God that way? By the way, the word appears many other places. Would you like to know a few? I thought you would. Acts chapter 15, verse 13. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Is the apostle speaking. Hearken means listen with the purpose of obeying and hiding it in your heart. James chapter 2, verse 5, hearken, my beloved brethren. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus says, hear and understand. It's the same word, akrabus. Mark chapter 4, verse 23, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. By the way, that appears numerous times in the book of Revelation. John chapter 6, verse 45 says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. 
God wants us to hear. God wants us to know what the issues in life are. But he wants us to know more than just what the issues are. He wants us to know what we believe, why we believe it, and how practically we live that out. And that's, that's essential. It's really why we gather as a church. It's actually where some churches have failed. If I just tell you, or as a church, when we come together, we just learn what God wants to do, but we don't learn why, and we don't learn the how, then we have not heard God. Oh, we might know the facts, but we've not instilled it in our heart. I'm going to talk more about this in ABF. We need to hear with the purpose of obeying. So let me ask you, do you hear God this way? Do you listen for God to speak so that you may diligently, deliberately obey his intentions? To hear is, is much more than just listening. It requires a preparation of our heart to receive and a persistence to follow. The second aspect of hearing is, is hiding God's truth in our hearts so that when we're confronted with temptation or times of uncertainty or, or moments where a decision is necessary, then you have the discernment from God's word to know what to do. Discernment on how to proceed biblically. When we're confronted with moments of good and evil, do you hear God? Listen, there's a lot of fake news. There was fake news before President Trump ever came along, right? Before he declared it fake news. Satan is in the business of fake news. He's been perfecting it for 6,000 years. The world is filled with fake news. And do you ever, do you ever want sometimes, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but sometimes I, I watch and I listen and I think, how can people be so blind? How can they not see the truth? And I've heard this from many people who, be, who become, I, I, I have the privilege of being saved when I was young, but I hear this from a lot of uh, adults who get saved. They say, I, it's like a light bulb went on. Everything, things, things were clear. I understood good and evil and right and wrong on such a higher level. Well, that's hearing. That's Shema. That's hearing the word of the Lord and then, inst- and then absorbing it and obeying it. And that's what God desires. And that's what Solomon was after. Solomon says, I don't just want to know what is, what is good and be a good leader or a powerful leader. I want to lead the people spiritually, God, the way that you want me to lead them. Not in my own strength. What an incredible, humble, beautiful articulation of what God expects for each one of us. When you're confronted with moments of good and evil, can you hear God speaking? Well, the end of the story with Solomon is that God is pleased. You can turn back if you want, or you can just listen, because in verse 10 it says, And the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon had asked this thing to hear. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast thou asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked thy for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to these words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither shall neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And so God blesses him. He's pleased. He blesses Solomon uh, with uh, knowledge of spiritual things. He even says it, understanding to discern judgment. It's more than just wisdom. Hearing God speak and obediently following is important. We don't gather to get knowledge. We don't even gather just to get wisdom. We should gather to hear. To hear with the purpose of obeying from our heart. 
the most important means for you and I to hear God speak? His Word. That's why we have to be in it. And this Holy Spirit uses His Word and He uses other people using His Word to encourage and challenge and strengthen. Do you hear God speaking? Do you hear God with your heart? You should, as you read, meditate, memorize God's word, he will speak. Do you hear him? I mean, really hear him with the purpose of obeying. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are very careful with us, that your love for us overpowers our sin but Lord we need to hear from you we know it's not a lack of you communicating you have given us your word you've told us not just what to do but why to do it how to do it Lord forgive us for falling short at just the what and accepting just the what or learning just the what and not listening beyond that Lord help us as a as a church, to instill in our young people and in one another a desire not just to know what, but why and how we follow you. Lord, that you would be pleased with the way that we listen because we hear. Lord, convict those, those of us who have been stagnant, flippant, about the way that we come before you. Lord, forgive us for failing to prepare our hearts to gather together in worship. Forgive us for being so easily distracted by the silly aspects of the world around us to the point where we stop hearing you. Lord, I pray you would encourage us now, encourage our hearts. Lord, we praise you that even in an auditorium this large with hundreds of people, that we can all hear you speak to us individually. Oh, we know we're not hearing an audible voice, but we're hearing your word penetrate our hearts and challenge us about what is true what is good, and what is evil. And Lord, I pray right now as you do that in each one of our hearts that we would be receptive. We would hear with the purpose of obeying. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to ask, maybe you're sitting here today and you do not necessarily know God personally like that. In fact, if you were to die today, you would not gain entrance into heaven because you do not know Christ as your personal Savior. I didn't necessarily talk about that, and yet that's the truth, that we're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. If you're here today and you've never been confronted with those truths, that's what God wants you to hear. But maybe you're sitting here today and you... You've been flippant about your worship of God or inconsistent about your obedience to his word. Would you do something about it? Would you shema? Would you hear with the purpose of obeying? And granted, I think every one of us probably has areas of obedience. We know the Lord wants to work on our hearts. But we're the one that's hindering it. What's God trying to tell you right now? I'm going to ask the piano to play. And as the piano plays, each one of us can just pause for a minute. Just listen to God speak. Ask God to reveal to you what you haven't been hearing, but you need to. And in a moment, we'll sing.